Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. It's good to meet you again for the first time. Uh, so, Lucy, I think I want to start out with you. I want to start out with your career trajectory mm -hmm. at Maxar because I think it's wonderful and something that a lot of people should aspire to. So you right. started a long time ago. Well, not a long time ago, but like, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. You started some time ago as I did. an intern, right? I did. In 2001, I was still in university, and I started out as an intern. Um, I was an aerospace engineering major and became a mechanical engineering intern working on the, at the time, the Mars Exploratory Rovers. It was one of the first rovers NASA was going to send onto the surface of Mars. And we were working on the two uh, robotic arms that were on the twin rovers, one robotic arm per rover. And I worked my way through design. I was a project manager for a while, project engineering, and then got into the people management side as well all the way through from 2001 to being general manager of robotics today. Yeah, that's, I think that's yeah. wonderful. So like you just, you have gone so high here and you have gotten to touch a bunch of different projects yeah. that have gone out to Mars, to, uh, to orbit, to all kinds of things. How many of your arms, your robotic arms, are still functioning today, like on Mars, out there in the, in the in space somewhere? So um, as Jordan said, we've got five robotic arms currently on the surface of Mars. So we are the Martians, right? Um, of those five, two of them are still in operation today. So Curiosity rover, we, our robotic arm is on that, and it's exploring the surface of Mars, drilling and coring. And also the InSight lander, we have a robotic arm on that, and that was, that's, that was still operating up until a few months ago as well. And it's functional just whenever NASA needs it. Does it ever get old? <laughs> yeah, like just making something and sending it to space and then being like, I made a robotic arm that is playing around on Mars right now. You know, it doesn't because the requirements and what we're doing, it's ever changing. The technology is ever changing. So you pair those requirements and what our government wants to do or what commercial customers want to do. And you pair that with technology as we're developing that technology, you know, the addition of automation, the addition of AI and all those things. It's never getting, it's never gets old. And whether you're doing the surface of Mars, you, you build on the heritage that you've, you know, established over the years of what you're doing on Mars. But the technology has advanced so much, and you can do so much more. You think of the first rovers, like I said, the first robotic arm that we did, um, you know, was just, you know, less than a meter long, and it had, you know, five degrees of freedom, five joints that actually moved to the MSL robotic arm, the Curiosity rover arm. It's almost two meters in length, and what we're working on in the future as well is working for, uh, to actually do in-space assembly. So take our robotic arms and build an antenna reflector, actually assemble it in space. So what we're doing and the requirements are ever-changing, and to be able to be a part of that each and every time is just the best part of my day. Like, I get to build robots and I get to send them to space. How cool is yeah, that? Yeah, it's amazing. Um, and so over, over these many projects, what would you say you have learned is the, the defining difference of building for space, building for a planetary mission versus building for something down here? So, yeah, the differences are huge, right? When you're building on Earth, you know the parameters you're working with, right? You know where you're going to send that robotic arm. You know what you're going to encounter, kind of like if it's a robot that's going to service something on the ground or a road, you know where you're going. Um, and you also can go and service it, right? Our robotic arms, once they're in space, we're done, right? Yeah. We can't touch it, and it's mission critical. It cannot fail. It has to survive. It has to work the first time. It has to work repeatedly, and it has to work for many, many years. To have our robotic arms have, you know, in the beginning, they were 90-day missions, and they last about 14 years. To have the That's MSL wild. Curiosity rover, right? It was a two-year mission. We're coming up on eight years on that. That just enables us to explore Mars that much better, to get that much more data. Um, so there's vast differences there. Additionally, you've got just the, the environmental concerns and differences, right? So on Earth, you don't, if you're going to send a robotic arm just into space, you've got radiation to deal with, you've got your temperature swings, you've got materials that you cannot use. If you're working in Mars, if you're sending something to Mars, you've got dust. dust. It sounds so mundane, it sounds so trivial, and yet dust is a huge part of the challenge we, we encounter. So. Here on Earth, you'd put a gasket, you'd put some rubberized material to prevent dust from go getting into your joints and your seals. You can't do that on Mars. Certain materials are not allowed to, to be used there. So we came up with a design to cut away a labyrinth system to prevent dust from getting into our joints and into our moving parts. And that's what enables our robotic arms to work as long as they have. 
so it's, it's this idea of you get one shot. So yes. this has to work the first time, every time. Yep. And on Mars. <laughs> the complication, <laughs> like difficulty level on yeah. Mars. Yeah. So I guess the, the natural question then is how do you test that? We, we don't have a, you know, you don't have a personal Mars True. to test on. True. We, we test extensively. We test every single step of the way. We've got I large so. test facilities in, in our offices. Um, and we'll test it all, the, all along the way. In the beginning, while doing trade studies, we'll do some you know, lab tests there. As we get into a subassembly of a motor or of an actuator, we'll test that, calibrate it, assess it, get the data we want, build up a robotic arm, test that as well, you know, compare it to our analytical models and see how it's operating. Is it operating as we expected? And once we have that baseline, once it's on Mars and we're getting feedback of what it's doing, then we can actually compare, okay, is this what we expected here? Did, is this similar to what we tested here on Earth? We'll take different elements into, you know, thermal vacuum chambers, uh, you know, mimicking what we're going to experience from the temperature and the vacuum and everything else. We'll do vibration testing to mimic what kind of launch environment mm -hmm. it's going to see in that launch vehicle. So we test it all along the way, and we've got, you know, large test facilities and, and, uh, and chambers and everything to do that. So, so your, your most recent opus, I should say, is going up on the Mars 2020 rover. Yes. Uh, I believe we have a, what would you oh. call it a, oh, is that, well, now you can speak. <laughs> uh, so we have something here today that I think we can, we can activate now. Yeah. Uh, is this, would you say it's a replica? Is this a lab prototype? Is this an engineering prototype? What, what, what exactly is this? So this is a demonstration robot. It's a demo arm for one of our satellite servicing robotic arms. So uh, the guys will put it up here on the stage. It's a seven degree of freedom robotic arm. That means that there's seven, dis seven distinct joints that can move um, and, and, and be manipulated individually, independently, and in, um, in unison. So the guys will set it up. And what we're going to see here is that this robotic arm is going to, uh, what you'll probably hopefully see on the screen is you'll get to see with the camera footage of what the robotic arm is doing. Oh, here we go. It's on the screen There we now. go. It's on the screen. And you can see a simulation of what, it's, what it should be doing when it's on orbit. And this is representative of the robotic arm actually doing assembly in space. What it's going to do is going to go to its home target and then come back. And what we have um, on that small table is actually nozzles, and there were fueling nozzles. One of the missions we're working on with NASA is to go and refuel Landsat 7. It's a government satellite. We want to be able to go and refuel that, and that's the Restore L mission. And how do you refuel something that wasn't necessarily intended for that? So how do you actually go service that satellite, give it, and give it extra gas? Because it's, you know, it's fully functional. It just needs fuel. Yeah. So this is what that robotic arm is, is used for. This is just a demonstration. We use it to test tools in our facilities. We use it to demonstrate events like this. We had the NASA administrator, Jim Bridenstine, over at one point. And you know he's a huge fan of Diet Mountain Dew. So we actually reprogrammed this arm to pour him a cup of Diet Mountain Dew as well. And so it's just, it's just a cool thing for us to test and play with. So what makes this arm unique versus ones you've built in the past? Like, uh, what, I'm curious, like, how much is left over from earlier designs, and how much is brand new? We absolutely build on the heritage of the earlier designs, right? But as, like I said earlier, as technology is developing, as we're doing, um, you know, we have more, you know, newer, newer technology to use. We've built on tools that we've developed in the past as well along the way. We, we build on the heritage we have, but we also always, we cater our solutions to the customer needs and the requirements where you can actually work alongside them and build that, um, build what, whatever they need. So looking at this robotic arm, right, based on comparing this one to one of the original ones, like I said, this is seven joints. So it can actually move as seven different joints move at one time. One of the original arms were five degrees of freedom, five joints, or four degrees of freedom. Being a seven degree freedom robotic arm, it provides an infinite set of solutions, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to point to a specific point, this can do it and hold that point and move all of its joints around there because it can provide that kind of infinite number of solutions, whereas the original ones just had more limited mobility. And we do that by being able to have a lot more power, be able to go down, down the robotic arm. You took, take our original Mars rover, uh, our small our Mars exploratory rover robotic arms, 
from the root to the tip, the number of connectors and actual pinouts to get power down to the tip, we only had about 80 conductors down at that tip. Then you compare 10 years later for Mars MSL, the Curiosity over, we had over 800. Hmm. So that's a huge growth in capability. We can send video feeds now and camera footage as well, things that we weren't able to do before. And I suppose, so that, that's part of this tension that you have in whether to choose a flight-proven heritage component or go straight out to the, the state of the art, uh, or even take something that's off the shelf to lower costs. So how, do you, how do you manage that? How do you balance those priorities? Right, so we absolutely try to balance that each and every time. We love to partner with small businesses and universities and bring in that technology, pair that with our heritage, and be able to provide NASA and our commercial customers with, you know, with a better value, with more opportunities, more, uh, you know, a, a, a broader um, wealth of technology and uh, different kinds of skills that we can provide them. We um, we're actually working on the on the next uh, robotic arm that's going to go to the surface of the moon as well. So that's in com collaboration with a university and small businesses to be able to work alongside that. And NASA as well is more willing to do these technology development type programs and they're looking for those kinds of solutions. They see that there's more technology out there. We need to find that balance of, okay, this technology is available. It may not be tried and true. How can we not increase the risk? Because like we said, this is failure mission critical. We don't want to lose um, the capability of a whole mission just because something failed. How can we pair that with something that is flight proven but really start to test these things out. You know, 3D printing is another great example mm -hmm. of that. We're doing a lot more of that. So what about also, as, as, the, as you mentioned, there's, there's more connections, there's more intelligence built into the arm that's more complicated electronically. If you have, a, you have an arm on Mars, say, there's too much of a delay for someone to manually control the arm and say, okay, go get the rock, get the rock. Uh, which is what obviously all the <laughs> all you do on Mars, uh, so it has to be at least partly autonomous, but it can't be fully autonomous. It has to know when to stop in case it's damaging itself or something. Uh, how has that evolved over the last few years as this has become less of a remote arm for someone and become an actual robot, a semi-autonomous right. Uh, entity? Right. So uh, we definitely have autonomy on our robotic arms. I would I, we'd like to call it a supervised autonomy. Right, so where there is a human in the loop, what we're striving towards is actually optimizing that autonomy. How do we get more humans just kind of monitoring it and being a part of that and letting the robotic arm or the robots itself do more? Um, you're right, there is latency, you know, anywhere on average about 13 minutes to send something to Mars and get it back. So we actually have, you know, uh, autonomous systems and fail safes within those robotic arms to make sure that it's going to be successful. And if, or if it gets into a state where we gave it a specific command and it actually got into a position where, A, it doesn't feel comfortable or it set off some alert, it will go into a safe mode. It'll call home. But it takes 13 minutes for it to call home. And then we have to assess what's going on and send a message back, and it takes another 13 minutes to get there. So we, 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 we add in those fail safes in order to make sure that we're not going to fail from the mission perspective. Um, but like I said, we're always trying to push the envelope. How do you add more? You know, over the past 20 years, we've had um, astronauts and it actually in orbit, right? Robotics is going to be such a more important part. Now that we're trying to send actual astronauts and humans onto the surface of the moon or eventually onto the surface of Mars, you're gonna need robotics that much more when yeah. you're physically there. Yeah. And having that autonomy, being able to use our robotic arms in ways that it possibly wasn't necessarily intended for is a perfect opportunity. I mean, we did that very recently. There was um, the NASA InSight mission. It would say lander. Um, and our robotic arm was supposed to place two instruments onto the surface of Mars. It did that flawlessly. Mission success, check, we were done. And it placed those two instruments on there. One of them was a seismometer and the other was a mole. Which the was mole. supposed to, the mole, was supposed to drill and penetrate down to the surface of Mars. Well, NASA scientists realized it wasn't penetrating as far as they thought it was going to. And so they wanted to take a look and they used our robotic arm to actually take footage of what was going on, take additional uh, camera views. So they got to understand what was going on. Then they realized, well, there's ground support equipment around this mole. We need to remove that. So they used our robotic arm to remove the ground support equipment. Again, it wasn't part of the programming. We were able to send that command to do that. 
And then they realized, well, it's still not digging. What do we need to do? And they actually used our robotic arm to apply pressure on the surface of Mars in, you know, to, onto the ground right around the mole, increase the friction, and have the mole start digging again. So you've got to balance that autonomy of what it was known to do, was supposed to place those items down on the surface, to now doing something that's not expected, give it that command to, in order to have mission success. And that's why robotics is such a big part. It will, it's an enabler in what you can do in space. And while we've been talking, the robot has been operating. Everybody's yes. been looking at that instead of us, so, <laughs> but that's, that's normal. Uh, so, and it has been, it's, it's doing a simulated task of like going and grabbing, a, grabbing the, something and plugging it into the nozzle or what? Yeah, it's, go, it's actually going in a, uh, so it, it'll go to its home target and get a sense of where it is, and then it'll actually go find the nozzle, align itself to the nozzle in order to attach to it. Right. And home is just where it would be all folded up. Exactly. For, okay. Yeah. So uh, how, much of, how much of the Maxar's work comes from NASA? So Maxar, at Maxar, we provide, obviously, robotics. We provide spacecraft. We actually have Earth imagery as well as geospatial analytics. So we do a lot of those things. A lot of what we do uh, from the robotics side is primarily from NASA. We have a lot of, we're, we're delving more and more into the commercial side of things mm -hmm. as NASA starts to, and the government starts to realize, hey, there's, there's, there's value. Space is becoming more and more available to our commercial partners as well. And so um, it's a balance, but we, we do a lot of things through Maxar. We can trace our heritage all the way back to the original moon landing, right? We worked on all the Apollo missions and provided the mission control centers for that. Well, I did that too, so. <laughs> so, so we do a lot for NASA and moving forward, being a part of the Artemis project that NASA is doing, trying to get back, back to the moon. We provide the power propulsion element for the gateway. Right, congratulations on that. Thank and the, the arm for the- And uh, the arm for that as well, the sampler robotic arm, which is gonna kind of the first robotic arm we've sent to the surface of the moon. So, and are you finding, you mentioned, you mentioned there's a little more commercial activity. Are you finding that there's, a, there's more business on the commercial side that you're getting from companies that are like, well, we're actually going to be launching a satellite. We could use one of those arms. Uh, it's definitely something we're, we're, we're working a lot more towards as well, absolutely. So just realizing that there are commercial partners that do want to send robotics and other entities over into space. Um, got a lot of commercial partners that are willing to do that, and we're happy to, to partner with them, provide them with the known space heritage that we have, and be that trusted partner for them. And what about the startup economy? I feel like in so many industries, startups are appearing that are challenging major industry players and legacy players that... Uh, honestly, the startups can move faster and you know, have SpaceX and things like that. Uh, are you feeling pressure from any startups, or do you expect that some of the startups that are out there right now in robotics and in uh, Starship, you know, Starship, Star, uh, 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 Spaceship Design, and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, at, are they are they a threat to you? Or are they a are they a potential partner? Like, what do you? How do you? Picture your role there. So I, I wouldn't say they're a threat because we're excited. We're excited to, you know, we're all engineers at heart. We want to give the best solution. So there's an excitement to be able to partner with that startup. They're doing a lot. They, they, they're not as encumbered as, you know, they're able to think um, out of the box more frequently. So we, we're able to partner with them. We'd love to partner with them. We'd love to hire if there's some people that startups didn't work out. We're hiring at all of our sites as well, whether it's Northern California, Southern California, et cetera. Uh, we love partnering with startups and universities develop, you know, building off of the technology that they've developed and they're try striving towards. While we have the experience dealing with our commercial, I'm sorry, with our government customers, we can explain to them exactly, you know, how to navigate those geopolit those political, you know, situations with NASA or with our government customers, the financing, et cetera. We've got that experience. We'll help navigate. So partnership is key when it comes to startups. Um, and we do that fairly frequently, even the one, you know, the sampler arm that we said for, uh, for the moon, where we've got partnerships with startups there. So and you mentioned hiring. Uh, this is something I wanted to talk about. I, I have, like, literally no idea what a team that creates a robot arm for a Mars lander looks like. Mm -hmm. Is it 20 people? Is it 200 people? Is it yeah. entirely mechanical engineers? Is it half mechanical engineers and right. the other half are liaisons to NASA? What does that look like? So and how do these people get into it? How do you get into it? So... It, it totally varies, right? It varies from the project to project, but the Restore-L mission that I talked about for NASA, I think, is just a beautiful example of that. When we first started the Restore mission, we're providing two robotic arms to NASA for that. We were doing small trade studies for NASA, and that was a team of about like five or six 
a couple mechanical engineers, mechanical aerospace, and a couple controls engineers, you know, had a little bit of more software bend to them. And we were working alongside, not, alongside NASA to do trade studies for them, kind of of how they want to operate their robotics or what they want to do. That was back in 2012. As we've grown, that, as that mission has grown and developed into the mission it is today, we're moving into the assembly side of things, the testing side of things, and we'll add on additional employees that, that are maybe on the manufacturing side, the technician teams, your um, analysis, you know, obviously becomes a big part of it, your testing team becomes a big part of it, and we'll have, you know, a few dozen employees working on us on a specific mission of, for that robotic arm. For that same restored mission, our, our you know, Palo Alto offices are providing the restore bus, so the satellite bus. When it comes to a bus, you've probably got a few hundred employees working on that mm -hmm. mission. So it really depends on the scale of the project. Um, but we have all types from structural analysts to mechanical designers, software engineers, test engineers, manufacturing engineers across the board. And we do that all in-house in as well um, and hi hire that because we want to be able to provide an end-to-end -end solution to, to our customers. Gotcha. And if you had to advise some of the some of the students here, maybe grad students who are looking to get into the space industry, uh, trying to get into this this sector, mm -hmm. what are the what are the skills that you have seen become more valuable over the last few years? Um, autonomy is huge, right? Autonomy, the software side of things, having a mixed blend, not just being a traditional mechanical designer, but having that a, a little bit more of the software controls background actually helps. It helps you uh, do more. It helps you become, especially for an organization like ours where you can do a lot. You can move across the program as the, as the program progresses. So if you've got a mixture of what you're able to do, both your mechanical design um, education and experience and then add to that. Maybe you've got a little bit of software bent to it. Maybe you can, you know, you know how to um, how to program a little something. That actually enables them to, to do more. So a breadth of knowledge is equally as important as depth and, and getting a PhD level in something as right. well. Right. So like I was talking about with Stuart Russell earlier, maybe they can go read a little Aristotle as well. <laughs> sure. Broaden, broaden your horizons. Broaden your horizons, absolutely. Um, so, uh, so I'm curious. Uh, we've only got about a minute and a half left here, but I, I'm curious, do you have a, like a secret room where you guys have the like, skunk work projects of like, all right, when we go to Europa, this is our this cool is arm for that. This is our underwater arm. This is our secret like, uh, you know, military arm. What, what, is, what does the secret room look like? Um, so the secret room typically ends up being my office because I've got a little um, kind of a four-person little little desk and t table and chairs in my office, and that's where we're actually doing a lot of that brainstorming. Um, our business development team and our strategists are actually working all the time trying to figure out how do we harness what we have today and delve into those additional new things. And so it's not it's not anything fancy by any means. It's just you know we we just like to do cool stuff. We're always talking about how do we advance robotics both in space and terrestrially. All right, well, you'd like to do cool stuff. What is the coolest thing you're working on right now or in the last couple of years? You know, the moon, right? The moon? Being you're working on the moon? Absolutely, <laughs> no, I'm working on the moon. <laughs> but I, no, being able to send a robotic arm to the moon, right, with the mindset of there's gonna be the first female astronaut on the surface of the moon. And for me as a female engineer, that's huge for me yeah. to be a part of that, you know? I'm not saying that, that Mars has gotten whole old hat by any means because the challenges, trust me, every single time, it's like we have a brand new challenge. It's, it's like doing it the first time every time. But um, being able to provide robotics for the moon, being, being a part of the power propulsion element on the gateway, that's just, that's where our government's going. That's where the future is. And be able to, being able to send astronauts back to the surface of the moon is, is what excites me. I'm excited to see that. I'm excited to see that for my kids and, and the future of engineers. Well, we have that in common. Thank you for joining us today. Thank it's been you for very helpful. Me.